really try to work with some content producers uh, in terms of the focus of sports entertainment. And um, so the mobile space is very interesting to them. So I'm trying to just give more background to them because of the fact that they're interested in distributing to mobile devices. And uh, the, their content can be indicated in more places. Uh, I don't know if that's really relevant to this session or not, but I thought it was kind of just check it out. My name is Blake Sattler. Um, I've been working in this space for about five years, building an overly ambitious project. Um, basically, I've got a uh, 3D animation and visual effects background, and I've been building an environment that you upload a photograph of yourself, and then it creates a 3D version of you, which can then replace actors and video clips, which then can be streamed to your phone, such that when you call somebody else, you're James Bond, or you're <laughs> somebody else. So it's all geared towards creating this uh, personalized video or ringtone type business model. And it's overly ambitious, and it's really expensive when you consider getting the patents worldwide, which I have. Whatever. It's, it's really nuts because I fall between the cracks. Silicon Valley thinks this is content, so they don't want to finance it. Hollywood thinks it's technology. They don't want to finance it. So I'm basically, I can't get financial workers, so I'm growing it finally. My name is Michael. I work at Cal State Northridge. We have a lot of students, like 30,000 of them. And they all have fun. Every single one of them, and their grandmas too. And they're all on it all the time too. So they're on it all the time. So uh, one of the big things that our students have said to us is that they want they want mobile enabled technology to help them with their day to day activities. They want to see their schedule. They want to see you know where they've got to go, um, what teachers are going to be you know uh, what teachers are sick. They want to know all of this stuff. And they want to know it from their phones. So um, we're actually looking at. Uh, using the technology that we have, mainly it's our PeopleSoft system, to do mobile delivery of all of that personal, private content. But for all of the other stuff, when it comes to departments, uh, user groups, uh, things on campus, uh, um, we're, we're going to Drupal for, the, uh, for the dissemination and management of all of that content. Um, the goal then is to give the student from the beginning to the end of their, um, their career at the university um, a more uh, in-depth, context-sensitive experience through the technology that they're using to help them through, you know, going through the different cycles and levels of, uh, you know, going through the university. So um, here we are. This is Mobile 1.0, in my opinion. Everybody's got a different phone, a different API, some different language. Um, everybody's got to develop 20 different things unless you're going through the browser. And so that's kind of where, uh, where I am with a lot of this technology is that um, still, the, the really the, the one thing that remains common to all these platforms still is the browser. So, you know, how are we using Google with the mobile browsers, ubiquity, feature sets, um, all of those different things, you know, because not, not every phone is creating people right now. We're kind of in the world of the old browsers and how the world works and stuff. And so, you know, I'm very interested in hearing what you guys have experienced.
Is it the viewport meta tag? Yes, it is. The Look viewport at that. meta tag. Uh, <laughs> adding this to my HTML has caused it all just to, uh, to be in that, you know, that Zoom level one mode where everything is, you know, in, in some instant readable um, text. This is yeah. here, yeah. It's, uh, it's meta meta name equals viewport. <clears throat> I'm just taking random notes here from things people are saying, and uh, maybe at the end there will be a useful list of stuff, and I'll post it to the session cool. thing. I don't know. with 
their um, Google Media Front video player to place anywhere. In the browser, in other phones, on the iPhone, on the iPad, everywhere. And the logic is provided by the place for actually uploading the files or how do you? Um, the module is the player itself. Okay. So you have to upload it. Uh, you just create um, a video um, um, and, and embedded video content with CCK. And just, you know, then you're uploading fine. And then you've got this little player page or you can use a player block and uh, you go to that on your iPhone or on your computer or whatever and it transcodes it for you. It's, it's free. It's free. We actually did, we just did something similar on another site I was working on, which is uh, called the Transmission, it's transmission.cc, and the new site isn't live yet, but this is a network of uh, video activists who, who use video for social environmental justice, and we just built a um, Drupal-based, as far as possible, completely free and open, HTML5 compliant uh, site that uses the video for everybody uh, code snippet. Um, which it basically does what the same thing that you're describing. In fact, I wonder if this they might even use some of the same code. But basically, the idea is that um, you know you want to use HTML5 and use the video tag to actually give people video. But lots of people are stuck with non-open standards compliant browsers like Internet Explorer. And um, so for them, you want to gracefully degrade and give them you know a copy of the of, of the content that they can actually access. And this is something that's for you know large institutions, especially thinking about what their mobile strategy is. Obviously, we have to pay attention to what's happening in the you know the codec space with you know video and whatnot. So, you know the the war with you know Apple deciding not to allow you know Flash on iPad and um, and Google releasing this new um, open uh, video codec. What's it called? Vim. VP8. Um, so so that when you're figuring out okay, how are you even going to what format are you going to transcode video to that you're then going to serve to people? Um, seems like probably you should pay attention to what's happening with this, and you probably want to transcode it to, to VP8, which also uses the odd Corbis for audio. Um, and then everybody will be able to see it, and you won't have to worry about paying uh, fees when H.264 you know, does whatever they're going to do in a couple of years. Does Firefox even Yeah, and it's in HTML5, not in Firefox, in Firefox, it supports the Osborne. Yeah, Osborne. Theory, yeah. But then Safari on the other end only supports HTML4, not Osborne. Is that right? Yeah, but they're all incompatible. Yeah, I'm wondering right now. But you only need. But what's cool and what we found like in building this transmission site is like you only need two copies, right? You just need the Vorbis copy and then the H.264 copy, and that pretty much will cover every browser case. Um, because those that are fully compliant, you can just use the video tag and give them the AUG. And you know, the others, you can basically display the H.264. You can play it with Flash if you need to. Um, so and it, just between those two. And it's only it's web quality video you're talking about, so it's not necessarily that huge a burden to do the two transcodes in order to cover pretty much every browser case, inclu including, um, well, actually, we don't know this, but probably most of the mobile you know, browsers, too. That's something we should test. Um, so the, the URL for the, um, the building iPhone apps that are just HTML and CSS and JavaScript is um, it's building-iphone-apps.labs.arriving.com. And the um, the code we used for transmission was it's the it's video for everybody. And I think it's just video for everybody dot org. Um, other ideas or questions that people wanted to kind of focus on. Um, I, I really want to like have us like think about for a minute this um, what phones does your user base actually have? Because that's how we started with the Vosmob project. You know, everybody, like people are ready to kind of throw money at the project to build, you know, iPhone apps. But we were like, uh, we don't think anybody we're going to be working with actually has an iPhone. <laughs> so 
it's been an interesting kind of path to do development for, um, you know, people talk about the bottom of the pyramid, um, but we're, we're actually talking about the majority of people on planet Earth and the phones they actually do have, which aren't smartphones with data plans. So again, if you're thinking about international context, you know, that also changes things. But I guess what we could recommend is, um, like when we started our process, the first thing we did was a survey um, at five day labor centers around LA and we asked people, um, do you have a phone? What kind of phone do you have? What kind of plan do you have? Which of the functionalities do you use on it? Um, and so then we got a picture of the service providers and the types of phones and types of plans we were actually working with and so we built our system around that. So I guess one thing to do would be um, to not just assume that because, yes, obviously the overall trend is towards you know, smarter phones with, um, with cheaper data plans. You know, Metro PCS now has this you know, $40 a month unlimited, everything including data. So that it is going to become more common and we can hope that it will you know, spread much more widely. But at the moment, we're still talking about um, the majority of people not having data plans. And so to kind of maybe do like surveys and or focus groups at the beginning of your process with the user base you're going to work with, um, before you just assume that because apps, apps are so hot, like that's going to cover your basis. It, it might, but it might not, depending on what your, your project actually is. Well, when, when you say that most of these people have don't have data plans, so how are you going to give them content or apps or whatever you need to do? Using um, MMS. So a lot of the phones are, like over 80% of the phones are MMS capable, so they can take photos. Um, a lot of them can take short videos too, but even if they can't do videos, they can usually um, take photos and do audio recordings. And we found out a lot of things through this process that um, a lot of people don't take advantage of a lot of the functionalities their phones do have. So you can do multi-slide MMSs that have multiple images with an audio clip attached to each image that will play in sequence you know, on the phone, even on the really you know, cheap phones that people have. So you can imagine there's a lot of amazing possibilities for content, both production and you know, dis distribution in terms of kind of audio visual slideshows, um, which can actually be a very kind of compelling, you know, content format. Um, that's one of the things that we've been, you know, playing with a lot. Um, and then in a university case, again, I don't know, I mean, I assume that probably you have a much higher proportion than the general population does have, you know, data plans now, um, regardless of sort of background, but still it's something to just kind of, you know, survey and research and, and before you build, before you make the strategy, are you guys doing uh, doing any of that kind of thing? We're just in the beginning stages, so yeah. Yeah. yeah we already did. We, I have to go look up the survey and find the data, but it was almost overwhelmingly with smartphones. It's all smartphones, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was something like seventy percent had a smartphone. Interesting. So that's what we went for. Yeah. Because you know, the college students and a lot of them are going on, mom and dad is dying, so. Yeah, definitely. And so then the question would be kind of like when we talk about accessibility, mm -hmm. like so the in the accessibility session earlier today, was anyone else there? Yeah. Um, so they were, it was like, you know, around 20% of, you know, your users are going to have some type of disability. And so you really want to think about how do you build for that, you know, that segment of your, your users. And so it would be a similar thing in the mobile space, right? So 70% have smartphones. That's great. You can focus your resources on that. But you might want to also figure out, okay, what about that 30%? Well, we have and, to do it at UCLA yeah. because we have to be so yeah, right. we've got to do both. Yeah. So does anybody want to talk about like uh, I don't know, meaning with your whole site and mobile? Like anybody even talk about that? I gotta talk about that. So yeah, the the mobile game model.
Well, hopefully and ideally, and that's part of the conversation, right? Like apps versus mobile browsers. I mean, ideally you don't want to have to um, be building a new theme for each phone, maybe just for each mobile browser. Um, and then you don't really have to worry about the hardware because there's you know, thousands and thousands of different you know, mobile devices. But that's like the big debate because um, actually Mobile Active recently did an interesting study. Have you guys seen this site? Um, mobileactive.org. Um, they're focused more on the nonprofit um, and NGO sort of community, but they do a lot of stuff that might be really useful insights for someone in education or even for someone doing you know, a business plan or whatever. Um, so what they do is basically they're constantly doing case studies around what's going on in the nonprofit and NGO space with mobile phones, and they have like these kinds of categories. They even actually do have an education category. And so they're looking at what are people doing to use mobile phones as data gathering devices, also how are people delivering content to mobile phones, how are, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And one of the things they just recently did was a uh, comparison between, oh, I don't know where it is now. Oh, look here, how to mobile optimize a WordPress website. That's useful. Um, so they do these how-tos and case studies. Um, I highly recommend the site, browsing through it. But your question made me think of them because they just released this um, sort of comparison of if you're an NGO, like the strategy of like apps versus uh, mobile web, like where to focus your resources, and basically, you know, kind of comparing point by point the trade-offs that you're getting when you pursue one of those strategies. And the thing with apps is it's like it only works on some phones. It's a really heavy investment of time and development energy because you're going to be constantly building new apps for different, you know, different mobile platforms. Between like Android and iPhone, you're still only getting like 30% of even the smartphones, I think. Um, maybe it's a little more than that now. It depends where you are. But that what you get more of with apps is um, people are, it's easier to generate revenue uh, with an app because people are used to paying for them and like buying things within them than on the mobile web. People are less used to still um, you know, doing purchases. But they were talking about um, how a lot is sort of changing now where um, basically people are doing a lot more sort of mobile web development that looks a lot more that acts a lot more like apps, so that people have learned from app user interface stuff and are building more you know, mobile websites that, that feel like you know, apps when you're using them. So I don't know if it's a useful resource, I think, to think about that question. Uh, um, something that I've been really curious about, uh, last summer I learned about a um, Drupal for Facebook series of um, different modules, and when you load them onto your site, it So from a web browser, you can go to the website, and it's just your normal Drupal site. But from Facebook, it appears as a Facebook application. So they're actually changing what gets served. Instead of HTML, it's served, it serves F HTML or FTML, whatever the Facebook platform is. I'm really curious to see that same technique talking to mobile browsers. Because you know, if they're able to completely change what's being served, why not completely change what's concerned when it goes to a phone? Well, what's really interesting about that, too, is like, do you guys hear about uh, Facebook Zero? This, this thing? So, so Facebook has reached agreements with um, mobile phone companies in 30 or 40 countries um, around the world where basically the, those companies are going to develop, are, are going to deliver Facebook for free to all mobile users. Um, so basically, it's like a free data plan for people. They don't have to pay any extra money for it, but what they're accessing is mobile Facebook. And then the business model is that it's text only, and when people like click through the mobile Facebook that they're getting for free, um, they'll be then downloading you know media files and whatnot that they're going to end up then paying the mobile service provider. So it's it's kind of like the ultimate 
you know, in some ways it's, it's really bad for open web and open standards and whatnot because it's like Facebook will basically, we're talking about, you know, developing countries where people do not have computer access. So their primary form of access is the mobile phone. So it's like Facebook is positioning themselves to be the ISP sort of. Um, it's like the AOL wall Yeah. Like all over again. But, at the, but it's not exactly because Facebook is open in certain kinds of ways and you can, you know, but anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting moment and something to kind of watch when you're thinking about that, that space. Yeah. And people would be accessing the text only version of your content for free via sort of Facebook Zero. And then if they click through to the media stuff, then they're paying their you know, providers. That actually raises another interesting sort of theme in thinking about mobile, which is the privacy theme. Um, so there's been some interesting stuff recently in terms of trying to make mobile communication more secure and give users more sort of control over their privacy and their data. What was the thing you were, you sent me a link the other day? Um, en encrypted SMS. Uh, yeah, um, there's uh, something like, it's called Red Phone, and it's, it does Whisper, whisper slice. Yeah. yeah. So they have a few different apps. Red phone, whisper phone calls, and they have the the text one called Text Pure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I No, then they backed off after only like three or four hours though. Was that? They backed off on, after oh, only three or four hours. Totally three hours. Yeah, it went back up. They came, they came to some kind of deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that reminds me of this other thing going on, which is like peer-to-peer -peer wireless. Uh, it's not, sorry, peer-to-peer -peer mobile, it's GSM. Um, so there's a number of companies now that are building and starting to bring to market um, handsets that um, look for other handsets and just like route calls and data like peer-to-peer -peer through the mobile handsets using using GSM standards and then eventually I guess I don't know how they interconnect with like the standard phone system if one of them has a connection or um, but no no they, they can I think they're interoperable but so that's a whole interesting new uh, you know possible model that gets us around uh, the phone companies. <laughs> but. It's also like a new model because um, it's only really on the radar that it's actually appreciated as their creative director. What is that? What's it called? Yeah. 
Ya. Anyway, you can Google it on your own. Um, <laughs> how is um, UCLA thinking about the sort of privacy and security stuff? With yeah. Um, we have three different wireless networks all running on top of each other and offer different levels of security. Uh, there's one for just campus visitors, which pretty much gives you access to the web and nothing else. Then there's uh, a couple other VPNs you can join in. And pretty much every day, you're, you're forced to go through that if you're on a wireless network. And if you're, you need to set up a VPN profile on your phone. And if you're like most faculty and staff, you're on campus every day, and you do it once, and then you're good for a couple of years. As far as you know, trying to make mobile call secure in the class, you know, that's really up to the to the I'm kind of thinking more from the other side. So, like all of the additional data that you'll be gathering, uh, like about the students, um, you know, potentially. I mean, I don't know if you are, but we, are, um, we the team that's working on doing the mobile development, they don't have the extra resources, time, or even really the inclination. I mean, we don't really collect data on any of our users. You know, wired, wireless. We yeah. just truly don't. Right. Unless somebody complains, or unless we notice a gigantic spike in network traffic, we just yeah, really yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, that's one of the things that we've also dealt with some with this Basma project is mm -hmm. trying to think about, um, especially given the sort of political context in the U.S. with the debates around like immigration and SB 1070 and all that, like not um, uh, basically trying to figure out what is information we might be collecting unintentionally about like the people who are using our system and how to try and like make that as secure as possible. So, for example. Um, like lots of phones add a lot of information to um, to the EXIF like data in when you take an image. It'll include like you know maybe the phone model number, the the date, the location if it's GPS enabled, um, all that kind of stuff, which then gets sent out onto the web. And people like there was a demonstration at Wear 2.0 um, this year of I think it was I think it's like some company that's I don't know if they're part of Yahoo or whatever, but they anyway doing this demo of like scraping Flickr photos. Um, and creating maps of, um, of well, they were, what they were doing was they were showing, actually, this, this is really kind of interesting, um, the people's mental maps of what neighborhood they're in compared to what administrative maps are of the boundaries of like cities and neighborhoods and places are, of course, totally different. And so when people tag their photos that they're uploading to Flickr with like the name of place names and neighborhood names kind of thing, like this company like generated a map based on like scraping the metadata from Flickr photos around how people like mentally imagine where they are when they're taking these photos compared to the administrative maps. Um, so that's a very benign and kind of interesting use of that data, but you can imagine all kinds of nefarious ways that uh, that data you know, could potentially be used. And so thinking about um, you know, just when you're building you know, mobile applications or building a system that is, is working with mobile phones, Thinking about, on the one hand, like yeah, this is great, and we can do provide great services and stuff for people based on this. But also, what are the, you know, like potential unintended consequences of the amount of data that we're gathering, sometimes even unintentionally, about users, um, and just kind of, I guess, thinking about that when you build systems. Yeah, so there's actually some models that were developed a few years ago, actually, um, to uh, for human rights campaigns in other countries around the world. Um, for people that like document human rights abuses on their phones and send them to a website, um, a Drupal-based website, um, and so they they develop a media mover module for, for this site, and it has various plugins to strip the data from the messages that are coming in, so that people that are documenting these things that aren't going to get identifying themselves accidentally online. So, Is it like an include for media mover or something? Or? Yeah, so Media Mover is like the framework that allows you to process media files. And we actually use it uh, in Washington. And, it, and then there's all kinds of plugins that we'll develop for Media 
you doing for um, to just just do basic kind of coding or to do like you know image manipulation and uh, stripping the exit data that's the one up there. So um, it's definitely useful if you're doing anything involving getting data. Well, I mean, Media Mover is really just a framework. Okay. So it, you could, um, like, the cost of Media Mover is not a dedicated server. Yeah. But Media Mover allows you to do, like, third party posted service that's, that does the kind of stuff for you. So then you just have the overhead of, like, delivering the content back and forth over the network, which is a lot less than actually kind of serving. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Exactly something else you can play. Yeah. So Media Mover is a little buggy, so I encourage everyone to use it so you can help us. <laughs> so that like I'm not by myself. <laughs> Do you want to talk about SMS framework at all? What's going on with that? Um, sure. Does anybody here use SMS framework? Okay. SMS framework is really cool, but I feel like it needs more employees in it because there's just a lot of feature requests and bug reports that are kind of sitting in the queue. So um, it's it has two different branches right now, like the original like one .x branch, and then there's like a new branch that has some new features, but it's not really done yet. So um, it basically allows you to send and receive SMS messages into your Google site, and it works with different SMS gateways, like commercial gateways, um, where you like pay on PP, and also it supports the, the email gateways, which is what we use in the last month. So the email gateways are free as long as you're not sending like millions of messages. So um, and we haven't we have uh, the limit yet, but there, there are limits on that. So um, yeah, I mean it's a it's a great framework um, and it basically like provides the, the user interface for the users to register on the site and they indicate like what their phone number is. And then um, it also has some functionality for people to actually register directly to their phone rather than having an account already existing on the website. So um, that's what we use with Bossmod for, for people that don't have a computer. So um, there's like a, some built-in functionality in SMS framework where you you need to like plug a script into your mail server that talks to the Google site and says, oh, we have a new user registering through SMS. Um, and we, we kind of wrote our own custom code that was a little different. We're using now and we're a module that checks the mailbox and then sends the email messages to the Google site. So um, there's kind of a couple different ways to get the messages into your Google framework. What about the last mm -hmm. The um, mail handler? Yeah. Mail handler is like basically a module that checks a IMAP or a Fox server and then it kind of assumes that all the content coming into the mail server is going to be stored in the mailbox is um, like, a, like a node. So it's kind of geared towards harvesting the messages and turning them into nodes. But we actually use it for generic messages coming in. So sometimes we'll, you can kind of override what mail handler does by putting your own custom plugins into it. Because it has books that other modules can extend. So like what we do is we, we kind of like latch on to certain incoming messages and say, oh, this person is trying to register a new blog and set their username um, if it's starting with a certain mailbox. So then we grab that message and like do whatever we'll do whatever the message says, and then we just kind of throw it away. Other messages come in it's like incoming content that we want to post onto the blog and the site. So it's pretty customizable. You basically write custom modules for the process. And then in terms of um, sending content out from Drupal sites to phones, um, other than through um, an app or a web browser, like so basically sending SMS and MMS to phones, there's a bunch of you know, stuff you can do to do that. And so you can use SMS framework uh, to do that, and you can use one of the commercial sort of providers to actually do the sending. Or what we're doing with BossMob is we're using, again, those free gateways that the phone companies provide. So we, we actually know the users, um, like every phone has an email address basically in the US. 
So you know, if you're on AT&T, it's like your number at sms.att.net or at mms.att.net if you're sending a multimedia message. And so we actually can just send, um, like we send an email to that address and then we let the provider you know, move it from an email to an SMS or an MMS and deliver it to the phone. If you're doing a larger project that needs to scale, again, you would probably want to use one of the um, services and, you know, instead if you're doing in bulk. Cool. Any last mobile thoughts? Um, Mark, where are you going to post that video? From your phone. Um, yeah, it's too big to send as an MMS, so I'm gonna have to like do a Bluetooth connection. All right. And I guess I'll post it to Cosmo. All right, and, and then I can also post it to any other the link to your session. Yeah, we'll put we'll post some um, some stuff in the in the session page. Is there any other like Google videos out there? I think there's a there's a Drupal video aggregator site. Videos.com. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Huh? Oh, sure. My marketing personal. <laughs> <laughs>